this is where we start. Out in the galaxies where the light originated, star children. And if you look at the stars with the naked eye, you'll say they're all white, aren't they? But it's an illusion due to the distance, because any luminous object becomes white at a sufficient distance. But if you look close through a telescope, it's, it's brightly colored. This is a swan, for example. So usually stars, galactic clouds, newborn stars, are closely monochromatic. They have a very definite spectrum of radiation, but we cannot tell it with the naked eye. But it is known that all origins of biological and molecular life originated from stars. So we are star seed. And this is the origin of light and color. It starts way out in the galactic branches. Here is another one. There again we see very <coughs> bright color. Because a dictum often goes that the colors in nature are bland and soft and subdued, but no way, some of them are very, very bright. And it has been known for a long time that humans and animals are very strongly attracted to bright, saturated colors. That the ancient cultures never appreciated dull earth colors because they wanted them very strong because color is information. So it's like talking homeopathy. The purer the remedy, the stronger the information, so to say. And then we land on a tiny planet out the fringes of the galaxy. So this is violent territory. It's a blue planet, known as the blue planet. And looking at it, we are the first generation ever to see our Earth from space. So it's also a science fiction story we're entering into. So every living being on this planet is bathed in blue. And seen from space, it's a gem. It radiates. It has an atmosphere. <coughs> And it has oceans. Very few known planets have liquid water. There are liquid oceans probably on the moon Titan, which is the moon of Saturn, but the oceans are made of frozen methane. So <laughs> liquid water is very rare. And our biosystem rests on water. So all color phenomena that we experience are largely based upon water. And we being from 60, 70, 80, 90 percent water, depending on your age, we dehydrate as we get old. Mm. So babies are highly liquid, but we get like raisins when we get old. <laughs> we tend to dry up. Yeah. But it also means that water is highly electromagnetic. It interacts with light, which again is an electromagnetic medium. It also means that we humans are actually liquid crystals. Large amounts of liquid in membranes, multiple membranes of multiple refractions. And then you look at a riddle. That's the first riddle we are looking at galactic light, planetary light. What is the speed of light? 380,000 kilometers. If you go metric. And that is in vacuum. But I hope your brains are not a vacuum. So in organic tissue, biological tissue, which is like liquid crystal, it is known that the speed of light is very close to zero. In a ruby crystal, the speed of light is 50 meters per second, which is the speed of a motor car. And in a liquid crystal, which is humans, you have multiple reflections in membranes, you get standing wave oscillations, and the speed of light stands still. So when you talk photobiology, we're not dealing with vacuum anymore, we're dealing with living beings. And that's a very different step we're taking. Clouds, vapor. So this is the light, the background light, the scattered light that nourished and fed us. And I personally don't believe that blue light is that bad, because then we would have died long ago. It's been around us for quite a while, this beautiful blue planet. So there's more to blue light than being naughty and bad, but that's not the chapter. And the sun the powerhouse of this stellar system where we live. So all biological life forms are nourished by this energy source. And it's a mystery how it actually works. The age of the sun is estimated 10 billion years. The age of the Earth is just half. It's 5 billion years across the model. 
But through nuclear reactions, this energy is slowly fed through the stellar system. It takes, from the center of the sun to reach the surface of the sun, it takes a light one million years to come out. It bounces back and forth and eventually, through Brownian motion, reaches the surface. It takes a million years for light to escape from the mother sun. Think about that. Or the moon. These were the only natural light sources when we were young. Sunlight and moonlight. And when the sun went down, you might have moonlight and that was all. Moonlight, you'd say, is only reflective sunlight. And it is and it isn't because moonlight is polarized <coughs> light. The moment you get reflected light, it usually goes polarized. And it's known that polarized light has very interesting biological properties. It's also known that it influences, it resonates differently in biological tissue. And it's also known that the lunar cycle of 28 to 29 days usually closely correlates to the female menstrual cycle. So it's a biological clock that rules you ladies. Your body system is largely ruled by a planetary body that reflects polarized light. <coughs> It was known, and it's been forgotten, but these are the first steps going into photobiology. Why is it so important? What is hiding in here? What's so special about moonlight? And people get lunatic. And this was known that around the time of full moon, people got mad because the liquids in the brain started to resonate, of course. And unless it was closely stabilized, it wouldn't work. Here comes the next step. Kavalabut spoke about it already, so this parallels it. One and a half million years ago comes the first artificial light source, heat source. And this is the first step from being primitive animals to becoming humans. First step of civilized man who learns how to use light because it was a source of heat, it was a source of light. It also meant security. Animals were afraid of the fire. It meant cooking. It meant civilization. This meant getting breakfast instead of becoming breakfast. That's a vast <laughs> yeah. difference, really. Yeah. So this is the first step into the light age where we live today. But it meant, like, people would go to bed, and if they didn't have any light, they would have to do without it. Because just imagine to make up a fire. You don't make it in a second or two. Because the next step eventually came. Domesticated fire. Do you see it in matches, in lamps, in torches, in candles? And this was the only light source for a million years and more. <coughs> so, getting very close in history now comes the artificial electrical light. No, there is one intermediate step. It was harvesting UC light because you say, well, couldn't they use windows? Well, they could, because these are old window panes. But you notice that they are not transparent. So transparent glass was not invented until recently. This is Roman window panes. <coughs> so the Romans used window glass, but it was not very transparent. You would get light, but seen through a glass darkly. That's the saying, in that the ancient glass was very dark, very murky. So sitting inside of a room, you wouldn't get much daylight and you would use firelight, artificial light. But it went 